everyone, and welcome to The Circle Opens, a podcast devoted to a chapter-by-chapter review of Stephen King's The Stand. Need an affordable source for Stephen King books, movies, collectibles, and more? Make sure to visit Secondhand Bookery at secondhandbookery.etsy.com. Listeners of this podcast can use the coupon code The Circle for 20% off their order anytime, and there's always free shipping to the United States. That's Secondhand Bookery at secondhandbookery.etsy.com. Welcome back, everybody. As always, I am Sarah, and thank you for joining me this week on our journey through the stand. This week, we found out from the Television Critics Association press tour that Josh Boone's adaptation of the stand will be released during the fourth quarter of this year for CBS All Access. I believe for TV quarters, that should be somewhere between November of this year and January of 2021, but I could be wrong. It could be October through December, but I'm going to kind of guesstimate that we'll probably see it around November or the end of November. This is what I'm hoping anyway. Um, There's no official release date just yet, but it definitely sounds like we will be getting the stand miniseries this year, which is very exciting news because there was also some news this week that Amazon did not pick up the Dark Tower uh, pilot. So they will not be going on with the Dark Tower series on Amazon, which is a big bummer. Um, <laughs> I was really looking forward to that, too. Um, I just started reading the Dark Tower series this year for the first time. And while the gun- Gunslinger, um, again, is a little difficult for me to get through, I'm very determined. I've heard great things about the rest of the series. So um, for all the Dark Tower fans, like I really feel you guys. <laughs> so I'm hoping that maybe... Um, Another streaming service will jump in and pick up uh, the rights to that series and give it a go. So I have a feeling 2020 is going to be a very long year for so many reasons, but this gives me something to look forward to, and I hope that you guys are all excited for it as well. Um, Also, in terms of the stand, there was, um, I don't even want to say casting news. It's just something that um, a follower of mine on Instagram sent me, um, Fiona Dorif's Instagram uh, story and she is an actress and she has been in um, uh, the cult of Chucky and she was also in the Purge series on Sci Fi. Um, Fiona Dorif, uh, yes, if that name is familiar, she is also the daughter of Brad Dorif, who is just an icon to me in Hollywood. He has um, been in so many fantastic things. He's a great character actor. Um, I think most people might recognize him as Worm Tongue from the Lord of the Rings uh, trilogy. However, Fiona. She's an actress as well. She's really great, actually. I think she's fabulous. And she post- posted on her Instagram story this week that um, she is, she's been hinting that she's been cast in the stand. Um, I follow her on Instagram, and she has had some Insta stories with her reading the book. Her nails are hella long. Like, <laughs> okay, I'm 39. I should not be saying hella. <laughs> But her nails are really long. Um, they look great. I couldn't pull it off, but she can. Um, but she is, she posted an Instagram story um, about how excited she was about Josh Boone's adaptation. Um, she says she's never seen anything like it. She's never been a part of anything like it. She seemed like genuinely excited about this. And she also revealed that she is playing Rat Man. Like, this is a great gender reversal for this role. Um, she also said that the costume that she wore the day before was made of rope and human hair, which was just wonderfully gruesome, if you ask me. So um, just a little bit of what I've seen from set photos and from what I've heard, um, Josh Boone is really taking this adaptation and, you know, really jumping into the R rating. And I like that it sounds like he's making it very dark, which it should be. So Fiona Dourif is playing Ratman, and I'm really excited about this. Ratman is a great minor character, and I'm really looking forward to seeing um, how she uh, interprets that role. There was also an article about um, a shooting location for the stand in uh, uh, Vancouver. It's called the Pink Palace in Surrey, and I think it's the Pacific Inn, but it's this hideous peachy pink color. Um, And I know it's going under renovations to reopen, but right now the interior is being used for uh, some of the shooting. And I wasn't really sure what they would be shooting inside. It really could be anything. Um, And a follower of The Circle Opens at Facebook, Scott Phillip, um, suggested maybe it was the interior, the inside of one of the CDCs, which um, I could definitely see that given the 
the size and um, the layout of the hotel could absolutely be a uh, hospital or the interior of the CDC. So that was a pretty good suggestion. But um, I guess we'll just have to wait and see because there's really no other information. So I posted an article about the Pink Palace on the Circle Opens Twitter account if you guys want to check that out. And that's all I have to tell you guys about the Stand uh, miniseries. So we are going to recap last week in Chapter 37. Stu is out of Vermont walking toward the ocean. He's passing through New Hampshire when he happens upon Glenn Bateman and his dog Kojak. Glenn is a former assistant sociology professor with some um, cynical worldviews. He and Stu get on pretty well, though, and Glenn expresses his fears that despite the purging of humanity, those left behind will simply reconvene and start all over, not having learned a thing from the superflu. He also reveals that he has a recurring dream or nightmare of a man with no face. That night, Stu sleeps in Glenn's home, and he has a dream about the same man. So this week, we're going to dive into what seems like um, a favorite chapter among a lot of King fans and among a lot of fans of this book. Chapter 38 is something that I call the second epidemic chapter, and I'm going to read the first paragraph before we talk about it. As the super flu epidemic wound down, there was a second epidemic that lasted roughly two weeks. This epidemic was most common in technological societies such as the United States, least common in underdeveloped countries such as Peru or Senegal, In the United States, the second epidemic took about 16% of the superflu survivors. In places like Peru and Senegal, no more than 3%. The second epidemic had no name because the symptoms differed wildly from case to case. A sociologist like Glenn Bateman might have called the second epidemic natural death or those old emergency room blues. In a strictly Darwinian sense, it was the final cut, the unkindness cut of all, some might have said. So we get 10 small vignettes of Captain Tripp survivors here. No one mentioned in this chapter are people that we've heard of before. Um, and But the reason this is known as the second epidemic is because not everyone who survived the super flu would remain living. Civilization as they know it is over, but death is still a natural part of life, no matter how it happens. And so in chapter 38, King describes the untimely, or timely depending on how you look at it, end of people who are lucky enough to be immune to the super flu. So before I begin to talk about these survivors, I just want to give a really quick uh, warning. I know this is a heavy book, and we've already discussed a lot of heavy topics, uh, but this particular chapter does have a survivor that um, is very scared of sexual assault or the uh, potential of sexual assault in this new world. So Um, If that's something that would bother you, I just want to give you a really quick warning that I will be discussing that in this chapter. So we start with Sam Tauber. He was aged five from Murfreesboro, Georgia. He lost his mother on June 24th, and on June 25th, his father and younger sister, two-year-old April, died. On June 27th, his older brother, Michael, succumbed to the super flu, leaving Sam alone. He wandered up and down the streets of his town by himself, sometimes crying, sometimes not. Eventually, he learned that crying didn't bring back the dead. On July 2nd, Sam went into a field of wild blackberries and fell through a decrepit well cover that was buried in the grass. Sam fell 20 feet down and broke both of his legs. Sam died 20 hours later, as much from fear and misery as from shock and hunger and dehydration. Irma Fayette, aged 26 from Lodi, California, Irma was a virgin and terrified of rape. Irrational fear, yes, but Irma really takes it to the extreme, which can be traced back to her mother, whom she had lived with up until about about five years prior when her mother died of a stroke. Her mother had told Irma all about her father, who deserted them. He was a beast who got drunk and then wanted to rape her. They all did. This is what Irma's mother believed and told her daughter that when you got married, that gave a man the right to rape you anytime they wanted even in the daytime. It says Irma's mother always summed up her husband's desertion in three words, the same words Irma could have applied to the death of almost every man, woman, and child on the face of the earth. No great loss. So being alone in the midst of the chaos and violence, Irma is, you know, rightfully terrified. When the looting and gunshots began, she hid herself in a spare room downstairs in her home and only crept upstairs periodically to get food or to go to the bathroom. 
Irma did not like people. If there was a chance that she was the only person living on the earth, that would make her happy. (laughs) But that wasn't the case. After everything calmed down, Irma looked outside and saw a drunken hippie man in a t-shirt that said, I gave up sex and drinking and it was the scariest 20 minutes of my life. He's carrying a whiskey bottle and has a pistol tucked into the waistband of his jeans. This prompts Irma to go upstairs into the attic and she finds a very old 45 caliber pistol that had once belonged to her father. The bullets inside are mossy and green, but she figures, you know, bullets don't spoil like food, so they should work just fine. It's metal. Irma has decided that she won't be hiding any longer. She could take care of herself, because now she's armed. She goes outside onto her porch to read a book, and this book is called Satan is Alive and Well on Planet Earth. Irma finds this to be grim and joyful reading, because the sinners and the ingrates have all gotten what was coming to them except for the hippie men, the hippie rapers, which she could handle. The blonde hippie man she had spotted earlier returns down the street, and he is extremely drunk. He begins to greet her, but Irma merely picks up the pistol beside her, ignoring his protests, and she pulls the trigger. The pistol explodes, killing her instantly. No great loss. In Nyack, New York, George McDougal is aged 51. He's trying to deal with the loss of his family. Being a practicing Catholic, he and his wife Harriet had 11 children, nine boys and two girls. But between June 22nd and June 29th, George lost his entire family to the super flu. He used to joke about not being able to remember his kids' names, but the order of their passing has now been engraved in his memory. Jeff on the 22nd, Marty and Helen on the 23rd, his wife Harriet and Bill and George Jr. and Robert and Stan on the 24th. Richard on the 25th, Danny on the 27th, three-year-old Frank on the 28th, and finally Pat. And Pat has seemed to be getting better right up to the end. George thought he would go mad. George is a jogger. He had begun to put on weight, so his doctor suggested jogging, which he began to do every night, short distances, and then longer and farther. His sons began to join in, and then some of the neighbors— Membership was always evolving as people dropped in and out, but it stayed a neighborhood thing. Even now that everyone is gone, George continues to jog every day for hours. It was the only way that he was able to fight off the impending madness. George cannot commit suicide because he's a Catholic, and being a Catholic means that suicide is a mortal sin, and clearly God must be saving him for something else. But now he gets up after a mostly sleepless night, and he kept thinking of his family, his children and his wife, and in the order of which he died. He gets ready to go out and jog. It says he jogged at first, but it became necessary to run faster and faster to keep the thoughts behind him. At 11.15 a.m., George suffers a massive coronary thrombosis and falls down dead on the corner of Oak and Pine near a fire plug. The expression on his face was very like gratitude. Miss Eileen Drummond of Clewiston, Florida. She gets very drunk on creme de menthe on the afternoon of July 2nd, the same day that Sam Tauber fell down into the well and broke his legs. Eileen wants to be drunk, because as long as she's drunk, she wouldn't have to think about her family. Eileen found some weed in her 16-year-old's room the day before and got stoned. But being stoned only made things worse, and she spent the day in her living room crying over photographs in her scrapbook. This afternoon, she drank a whole bottle of creme de menthe and then got sick in the bathroom. She went to bed, lit a cigarette, and fell asleep, burning the whole house down. And since the wind had freshened, she also succeeded in burning down most of Clewiston. No great loss. Arthur Stimson of Reno, Nevada, stepped on a rusty nail that got infected. He tried to amputate his foot in the lobby of a casino, where he fainted and died of shock and blood loss. Ten-year-old Candace Moran of Swanville, Maine, died of a fractured skull when she fell off her bike. Milton Craslow of Harding County, New Mexico, he was bitten by a rattlesnake and died 30 minutes later. And then we come to 17-year-old Judy Horton from Milltown, Kentucky, and she is quite pleased with the events that took everybody from her life. Two years before, Judy had gotten pregnant by an engineering student at the State University, a man called Waldo Horton a name Judy describes as a yuck name. She wondered why she had to get knocked up that it had to be Waldo. 
She also slept with Steve Phillips and Mark Collins, both of whom were on the football team. But after taking a look in her diary and doing the math, it could only be Waldo's baby. Even if she hadn't known, she would have known as soon as the baby was born because he looked like Waldo too. Yuck. Her parents talked her into marrying Waldo, and Judy had to suffer through crummy jobs while Waldo attended school. She hated Waldo's school as much as she hated Waldo and her baby. Why didn't Waldo quit school and work like she had? Her parents wouldn't hear of it, and neither would his. They were always in her business. Oh, Judy, things will be so much better when Waldo has a good job. Oh, Judy, things would look so much better if you'd go to church more often. Oh, Judy, eat shit and keep smiling until you get it down. Until you get it all down. Then the super flu came along and solved all of her problems. Her parents had died. And then her son, Petey, which she found to be a little sad, but she got over it in a couple of days. And then Waldo's parents. And then finally, Waldo himself. It never crossed Judy's mind that she would die. And she hadn't. They had lived in an apartment house in downtown Milltown. The selling point for Waldo had been a large walk-in meat freezer in the basement. Their apartment being on the third floor, it was always Judy who had to take the roast and hamburger down there. Since Waldo and Petey had died at home and the hospital services weren't attending to people like her and the mortuaries were full, Judy took them down to the walk-in freezer herself. The power had since gone out, but it was still pretty cool down in the basement. Judy knew this because she would go downstairs three to four times a day to look at their bodies. She told herself she was just checking, but honestly, she was gloating. She went down on the afternoon of the second, the same day that Sam fell down the well and Eileen burned down her house, and she went into the walk-in freezer, except this time she forgot to put the rubber wedge beneath the door and it shut, latching behind her. There was no knob on the inside of the freezer door, and by then it was too warm to freeze, but not too cold to starve. And Judy Horton died in the company of her son and husband, after all. Jim Lee of Hattiesburg, Mississippi, got electrocuted when he hooked up all the electrical outlets in his house to a gasoline generator and attempted to start it. And finally, Richard Hoggins of Detroit, Michigan. He was a heroin addict who had gone through extreme withdrawal after Captain Tripps killed off most of the dealers and users. He thought of a local dealer named Allie McFarlane, who had supposedly gotten a really good shipment of heroin in before the super flu. Richie didn't know where the shipment was, but he had heard that if the cops ever got a search warrant for Allie's great uncle's house, that Allie would go away until the new moon turned gold. So Richie decides to walk up to Gross Point, where Allie's uncle, great uncle, Allie's great uncle lived. He tells himself it's just a casual stroll, but really Richie wants to shoot up and he wants to do it bad. He breaks into the house, momentarily frightened when the alarms go off, but there are no longer any cops to respond to the forced entry. He does find the bags of heroin taped inside of the toilet tank. There was enough there to last a man 16 centuries. Richie doesn't think to wonder how much of the stuff was cut. On the street, the heaviest hit Richie had ever taken was 12% pure, and it had been, it had put him into a sleep so deep that it was nearly a coma. Now he injects himself with heroin that's 96% pure. It hit his bloodstream like a high balling freight, and Rich, Richie fell down on the bags of heroin, flowering the sh front of his shirt with it. He was dead six minutes later. No great loss. We've had enough chapters dealing with the super flu, the symptoms and the effects of it, how horrible it is, how gruesome the deaths have been from it. We also experienced a chapter where King takes us across the country, touching on the violence, the panic, and madness that followed the spread of the super flu. People getting shot and killed by each other, by the army and the government, People who might not have died from Captain Trips, but were in the wrong place at the wrong time, or just trying to do the right thing and facing punishment for it. Two ends of the spectrum there. And then somewhere in the middle are these people. And while we only get 10 names, you know there are hundreds, if not thousands, of survivors who meet their demise in a way that is purely bad luck, stupidity, or accidental. As King said at the beginning of this chapter, 16% of the remaining population uh, died from this so-called second epidemic. 
King is narrowing down the population even further, and he does it in a very effective way. Some of these were really emotional, and others maybe slightly more satisfying. Opening the chapter with the accidental death of a five-year-old is like a fist to the gut. I remember reading this book when I was a teenager, and I found it sad, yes, but, you know, it didn't hit me the same way it does now as an adult and a mother of young kids myself. After I read this chapter, I sat for a while trying to imagine myself in a situation like The Stand, an end-of-the-world scenario. And, of course, you know, with the last few weeks surrounding all of the trouble with Iran, it wasn't that hard to put myself in that position. I began to think about World War III and how if it ever happened, it would likely end with devastation. And you want to believe that it would never happen, but it could. So I thought to myself, you know, let's say that the world ends, leaving, you know, survivors behind like the stand. But what if something happened to me or my husband or both of us and my girls were left alone? Like, what would they do? Would anyone be there to take care of them? Would anyone have it in them to do that, to do what's right? So, you know, reading about Sam, um, it was really gut-wrenching. Dying alone in the bottom of a well with his legs broken, um, starving to death, it's horrifying and somehow so much more worse for me than any of the superflu deaths that we've experienced so far. Irma Fayette, on the other hand, um, you know, on one hand, I can understand her fear. Being a woman is difficult and it can be terrifying even during a time um, where the world hasn't gone mad. And she's scared of the people left behind, mostly the men, convinced that they're all um, rapists and they all want to attack her, thanks to her mother, who put that thought in her head when she was younger. She has an unhealthy distrust of men, and it seems as though that was the case even before Captain Tripps. Irma doesn't like people at all. She would be happy being the last person alive on Earth. And she hides until she finds her father's old gun and decides to use it if she has to so she can stop hiding. And that's fine. It makes sense to me. I mean, Harold and Fran decide to arm themselves, as does Larry and Rita and Stu. So Irma has the right to defend herself in this scary new world. But for Irma, it seems like she intends on using the gun even if she doesn't need to. She assumes that the drunk hippie man would attack and rape her. And she doesn't wait to find out. She lifts the gun as soon as he begins to speak to her. If the pistol hadn't exploded in her hand and killed her, she would have shot him, and probably without remorse. Um, In her mind, the sinners got what was coming to them, blonde hippie men included, and as King wrote, no great loss. Uh, You can't, I understand where Irma is thinking, you know, um, shoot first um, before she shot or attacked. Uh, You don't really know if this man was going to end up trying to attack or assault her or not, and she doesn't give him the chance to find out. It's a, it's a scenario to put yourself in. Would you shoot first, um, ask questions later, or would you just try to see, uh, what this man wants, where he's coming from? He's drunk and carrying a gun. So that is terrifying. So it's an interesting scenario. Um, Irma decided to just, uh, pull the trigger And based on what we know about Irma, the very little we know about Irma, that's not a surprising thing. She already sees him as an ingrate and a sinner. So he got what was coming to him or would have had the pistol not exploded and killed her instead. George McDougall. Um, I found this one probably the most tragic. Well, maybe not the most tragic, but the saddest. Uh, This poor man lost his family and his 11 kids all within a few days of each other. Five on one day alone, and he was left completely alone and on the verge of madness, finding comfort only in jogging, because that's the only thing that can distract him from his thoughts. Running away from his thoughts reminded me of Harold in chapter 36 when he was mowing the lawn, running with the lawnmower, running to try and escape his grief. George thinks of suicide, but being Catholic, he believes he'll be committing a mortal sin. And he can't do that. So he runs and he runs and he runs until he finally has a massive heart attack and falls down dead. King's last line here. The expression on his face was very like gratitude. George wanted to die, but he couldn't take his own life. So his heart stopped and he was grateful for it. He wouldn't have to live with the pain um, of being without his family anymore. And then Judy Horton, um, she is young. She is too young to have a child and be married. 
Um, she is still emotionally and mentally immature. She got pregnant when she was 15 and she um, is 17 when the super flu hits. And you can tell how immature she is based on how often she uses the word yucky in the narrative when she's describing Waldo's name and her own baby. Getting pregnant was the worst thing to happen to her, so she sees the super flu as a blessing. It kills everyone in her family holding her back, including her two-year-old son, Petey. She actually moves Waldo and Petey's bodies into the meat freezer in the basement, which is three floors down from their apartment. So that's quite a feat, especially moving an adult male body that's dead. Um, I have never done that. (laughs) I will hopefully never have to. Um, But yeah, that's got to be really difficult. Uh, But she was determined to do it. I mean, she complained about having to take the hamburger down three floors, and now she's willing to take two uh, probably heavy, stiff bodies down there to get rid of them rather than maybe just leaving her apartment. So, you know, that's not enough for Judy, though. She checks on her on their bodies several times a day, and that's what she tells herself that she's doing. She's just checking. Um, surely she wasn't gloating, um, but she was. That's the incredibly disturbing part of this, because who does that? It's like, you know, she's pleased to be rid of them, checking on their bodies for what reason exactly? Um, Is she making sure they stay dead? Uh, She's making sure they're not coming back to ruin things for her? Or is she so um, apathetic and so just without any kind of emotion towards her husband and child that she wants to go down and look at their bodies and just be like, huh, look at where you are. You can't hold me back anymore. Um, And this passage was probably the most repulsive one for me, um, namely because of Judy's callousness, especially towards her son. So, you know, uh, I wasn't all that sympathetic when she got locked in the freezer with her son and husband. No great loss there, if you ask me. And then Richie Hoggins, who experienced withdrawal and then decided to try and find heroin after the fact, I do not know enough about addiction uh, to comment much on this, but I found this particular passage to be just as sad as Sam or George. Even going through withdrawal, Richie doesn't see this as a clean slate to start over. He doesn't see this as an opportunity to stay clean and do something with himself. All he can think about is getting a fix. So he breaks into a dealer's uncle's home and he finds the stash. And within minutes, he's dead from an overdose. Just like that. To me, Richie's situation was like Judy. It was not like Judy or Irma. Um, The circumstances for me here feel much more tragic. We get some smaller vignettes sprinkled throughout. Uh, Eileen Drummond, who is so distraught over the death of her family that she spends uh, her days getting drunk or stoned. It doesn't help the grief very much. and it, It seems to amplify it, actually. And she ends up falling asleep in bed with a lit cigarette. And she burns most of her town down in the process. Arthur Stimson, he's died of shock and blood loss when he tries to amputate his foot. No doctors left, or at least not many, to help him when he steps on a rusty nail. A 10-year-old girl fracturing her skull when she falls off her bike. Maybe she didn't have her mom or dad around anymore to make sure that she was wearing a helmet. A rattlesnake bite taking the life of Milton Craslow, and a man named Jim Lee trying to start a gasoline generator with every electrical outlet in his house hooked up to it, and he gets electrocuted. You know, I guess some could say that this is survival of the fittest, and maybe it is. Maybe it seems like some of these deaths are just accidents, especially now that there are no emergency services to call. And we don't think about the things that we take for granted now. Um, I mentioned this in an earlier episode when the power started to go out. You don't realize how much you need power until you don't have power. We certainly would realize what we're missing when we no longer have them at our fingertips. King does a fantastic job in showing us a variety of people and situations. Different age groups different stories, different responses to the loss of family and friends. There's grief and shock, and there's indifference and even pleasure. A handful of people get a few paragraphs, and even in those paragraphs, King fleshes out each person, making them as real to us as Stu or Larry or Nick. We feel their pain. We recoil at their apathy. We mourn them just as we would have Janie Baker or Peter Goldsmith. 
at least um, a few of them. And he doesn't need to give every single victim a backstory. Giving us a few short sentences to describe a rattlesnake bite or an electrocution is just as effective as the time devoted to Irma or Richie. It's like we're recovering from Eileen's drunken grief and then getting punched with a botched amputation. And then on to the next one. And I really love these moments in the book, from the chapter where we see how the flu spreads across the country, to the beginning of the end as the government tries to contain news about the super flu, but people are beginning to riot and fight, to the aftermath now, with the super or the survivors of the super flu now just trying to survive, and not all of them are succeeding. And the last line in the chapter, no great loss. Is that true? Um, perhaps for someone like Judy Horton. But what about five-year-old Sam? Because his family is gone and no one is around who knows him, does that mean his death is something to shrug off? That seems to be what the world has you know, shifted into now, um, that the super flu has claimed everyone that is going to claim, and the rest are left to their own devices. So many of these deaths will probably go unnoticed now. And if you stop to think about that, it's really sad and it's really terrifying. Um, being one of... Who knows how many survivors of this flu, being alone, having no family, having no doctors, having no police, um, and then you fall down a well, and there will be nobody around to pull you out, and you will die alone. It's just, this is scary stuff. This is not monsters in the woods or goblins under your bed. Do you guys ever think about goblins under your bed? But this is not in-your-face horror, but this is a different kind of horror that really settles in the longer that you think about it. One character who could very easily go the way of Judy Horton, if no one comes around to rescue him, is Lloyd Henry. He's still locked up in Phoenix, and he's getting horrifically close to resorting to cannibalism. Maybe someone will come around and help a guy out, but we will have to wait and see in Chapter 39. And that's it for today, everybody. Uh, What did you think of Chapter 38? Uh, Did any of the vignettes touch you more than others? King continues to push the story without making us wonder, what about everybody else? Because we certainly can use our own imaginations now. He gave us a brief glimpse about everybody else and what's happening to them. It's not just the flu, and then life goes on. Death is still very much a part of things here. Only now, those living have to be even more mindful of what they're doing, because it's very likely that if they hurt themselves, no one will be there to call 911. And actually, there would be no 911 anymore to call. So that is it for this episode of The Circle Opens. If you're enjoying this podcast, uh, you can leave me a rating or review on Apple Podcasts or any platform in which you listen to to it. Um, You can reach me at thecirclecloses at gmail.com. If you have any questions or you just want to talk about this chapter, I'm also on social media at The Circle Opens. And I guess that's it for this week, you guys. Thank you for continuing um, with me on this journey through the stand. We only have a handful of chapters left in book one, Captain Trips, and then we'll be uh, diving right into On the Border. It's very exciting. Things are really starting to happen. And with that being said, M-O-O-N. That spells see you next week. 